Hey friends, and welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're gonna walk through a case study of a couple that came to me recently, and they said, hey Jacob, we're pretty confident in the fact that we're able to retire, but we're curious if there's any pitfalls or any things that we need to look out for or avoid in the future that could save us on taxes or could leave more money to our kids that we otherwise need to be aware of. So hopefully these ideas and thoughts give you a better perspective around things that you should be considering and looking at for your specific plan. So let's go ahead and jump into their situation and see what it looks Looks like. So right here we can see that Bill and Rachel are married and they've got two kids and Bill is 65 and Rachel is currently 57. They're hoping to retire whenever Bill turns uh, 67. So that's his full retirement age or just after his full retirement age uh, for his social security. Rachel at that point would be 59. So that is their current ages and let's take a look at their overall net worth. So they have around $2.8 million in a total net worth, but let's see what that's actually made up of. We can see that they have around $85,000 in cash between checking and savings. They also have around 2.1 or $2.2 million in their retirement savings, which is made up of a few different accounts. Uh, first, they've got $50,000 in a joint taxable account they recently started funding a couple of years back. They realized that they needed to have other assets outside of just tax deferred assets in their 401ks and IRAs. So they started funding that and we're gonna see how much they're putting into that every year in just a second. Also, Bill has a traditional IRA from old 401ks. He's rolled over and combined and consolidated just under one point. $1 million. Uh, Rachel has a traditional IRA around $460,000. Bill's current 401k is $235,000. Rachel's current 401k is $370,000. They also own uh, a home that they have paid for, and it's a, on an outright of around $600,000 is the value of that. So that leaves them with a $2.8 million net worth. Of that 2.8, around 2.2, 2.3 is actually liquid savings for retirement. So that's where their assets are and kind of how they're made up. Now let's take a look at their goals for retirement and see what they're trying to accomplish. So Bill is trying to retire at 67. I already mentioned that. And then Rachel would be retiring at that same year, but she would be 59 at the time. So there's an age gap there, which we'll talk more about here in just a second. Uh, also, they want to be able to spend around $7,500 per month in retirement. Right now, they're spending around $8,500 a month, so it's going to get cut back just a little bit. Um, but they also said they love to travel and they love to go and do and experience things. So they said, hey, $20,000 a year is kind of the amount we can budget towards that, uh, that we're not spending on a monthly basis or not using to go on trips uh, every single month. So $20,000 per year is what they're wanting to budget for that for now. But then also back to the age gap, you know, Rachel will not be Medicare age whenever she retires at 59. So she's got six years or so before she reaches Medicare part A and B age. And so we've got to factor that in accordingly for their healthcare expenses. So I've got Rachel spending around $12,000 per year, $1,000 per month um, during those years between uh, whenever she retires and 65. So that's how much her premiums would be. Obviously, any deductibles above that would be covered through uh, different sources of income. Perhaps they would just not go travel that year if they have a health thing going on. Um, so they could use money from the travel budget to take care of that. Also, once we get to 65, I got them purchasing a Medigap or what's called maybe a Med Medicare supplement plan. And out of pocket, that's going to be an additional $3,500 for each of them per year. So that's their goals. That's how much they're they're hoping to spend and things like that in retirement. Now, what about their income? Bill is making 160 right now. That'll go away when he retires. Rachel's making 90. That's going to go away when she retires. Uh, but more importantly, let's take a look at their social security. So Bill is set to get $3,100 at his full retirement age, which is just before age 67. He probably just will take it at 67 to keep it really simple and easy. Um, Rachel's social security at full retirement age is $2,300. And she mentioned, hey, I think I want to take that at 62. So we're going to evaluate that and see if there's any better way for her to do that or if it's most optimal to take it at 62. Also, Bill mentioned, hey, I've got a small pension from an old job that I had. It's going to be around $25,000 per year, and that'll just kick in whenever I tell it to uh, whenever I retire. So um, that's going to start just here at 67 whenever he retires. But again, it's small, yet we still want to make sure we factor it in. Also, over the last year and a half or two years of their working career, Bill is going to be maxing out his 401k, and then Rachel is going to be putting 10% of her income into that 401k. They each get a small match of 4% for Bill and 3% for Rachel. Also, they started saving to that joint investment account recently. They're putting $1,000 per month into it. So that's kind of where they're at. Now, remember, their big question was, Jacob, we think we can retire and do so successfully, but we want to make sure we optimize our money. How do we make sure we don't leave anything on the table in regards to taxes or potentially doing something 
something wrong from just an optimization standpoint. What can we do to make our situation better is really their question. So let's take a look and just confirm, hey, can they retire? Can they do so successfully? And the fact of the matter is yes. If they're only spending $7,500 per month in retirement, they're gonna have more than enough money between their different sources of social security, a small pension, and then also $2.2 million of retirement savings. They're gonna have enough money to sustain that lifestyle. Now, a couple things here is yes, we want to be able to sustain it, but also we wanna be able to optimize it. So whenever I'm talking to people like this and I'm saying, hey, look, we've got enough money to spend more than $7,500 a month. Would that be something you'd like to do? And a lot of times people will say, yes, we'd love to spend more than that, but we don't. We wanna make sure we don't run out of money. So that's something that we're gonna look at here right now. So for them, we're gonna say that uh, they're gonna increase their spending from $7,500 a month to $8,500 a month. And I'm curious how much that hurts their probability of success. So we can see that it actually only hurts it just a few percentage points. And um, for me, that's not worrisome at all. In fact, I'd say, hey, go ahead and spend more. So what if we increase that to $9,000 per month and make that change really quickly? Again, their percentage, you know, probability of success is gonna go down, but anything above 75% for me personally is gonna be in the range of success. I mean, obviously this is a Monte Carlo simulation doing thousands of simulations, but the reality of the matter is, is anytime we start going off course too far in, in regards to retirement success or never running out of money, we're gonna make the appropriate changes that need to be made. We're gonna stop spending if we have to stop spending or spend less if we need to spend less. This is just saying if nothing changes and you spend $9,000 a month for the rest of your life, you've got a 90% probability of success of never running out of money. Obviously, if you're gonna spend less than that, then that percentage goes up and increases. So this percentage of success is not something I would say that you should base your entire retirement on. Don't say I will or I won't retire because my percentage is or is not 100%. Um, just know that you're probably gonna make some adjustments along the way because things are not gonna go as expected and nothing is a straight line when it comes to investments or retirement planning in general. So for them, I'm gonna increase that to $9,000 per month. Now, for them, they also have around a 60-40 overall allocation in their accounts. Now, one thing I did wanna point out here is whenever it comes to their overall uh, asset makeup, what we did see here is that in their joint account, they're not asset location optimized. Now, what do I mean by that? For now, they've got a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio in their taxable investment account. I would prefer to see that be 100% stock if they don't need any money out of that immediately because they're gonna pay less taxes annually on stock dividends, which are qualified most of the time, and they're gonna have long-term capital gain potential uh, in that account if they're owning stocks rather than bonds. Uh, stocks are gonna be more tax efficient every single time, and because that account type is taxed every single year and you can receive a 1099 uh, from that account, it would be wise to perhaps lower those taxes by owning the right type of investments in that account type, which is called asset location. Also here on the traditional IRAs, they're 60-40, 60-40, 60-40, and then uh, Rachel's 401k is actually 80-20. So their overall allocation is around 60% stock, 40% bond. So I'm curious if we go back here to, to this page, we kind of take a look at you know what we've done so far. They're going to die with less money as we've said it uh, so far with taking $9,000 a month. But what happens if we increase their overall allocation from 60-40 to, let's say, 70-30? I'm curious if that is impactful or positive for them in any way. And it is. So we went from, you know, 800,000 less from where we started to only $200,000 less. Now I'm curious if this keeps increasing if we keep going farther uh, up this little line here from that to 80%. So we can see here that by taking on a higher allocation towards stocks, they're going to end up with more money one day. Now, yes, that means that they're going to take a higher amount of risk in terms of volatility in their portfolio, but we're going to account for that in a couple different ways. Number one, we're going to say, hey, we've got Social Security income at some point. We've got um, we've got a pension that's still, I guess, small, but it's still coming in. And so we're going to have a certain amount of our income needs every single month in a fixed uh, income stream that's coming in from those different sources. In addition to that, whenever we think about building out a three-bucket retirement plan in terms of how much money we need in cash, bonds, and stocks, and allocating those different buckets accordingly, we can still see that an 80% stock allocation is feasible for them if they're willing to take on that much volatility. So for them, they said, Jacob, look, I think we're willing to take that on. Obviously, could be subject to change, uh, but for now, we see the benefit of that because that means we're going to spend more every year in retirement, but also it could help us fulfill our goal of leaving a legacy for our kids one day. So we're going to keep that at 80% right now. 
in terms of the stock to bond allocation. Also, we wanted to look at potentially changing their social security election strategies. Now for now, we've got Bill taking his at 67, Rachel's taking hers at 62. So I'm not gonna mess with Bill's because that's gonna be a part of their income immediately there at, uh, at retirement. But let's say that we change uh, Rachel's to 67. Does that help us or hurt us overall? It actually hurts us, uh, we'll say hurts us a little bit because what we're doing is by delaying that for five more years, we've got to replace that income that we're no longer taking at 62 um, as it's currently set. And we're going to have to take that from our portfolio. So what you're going to do is you're actually going to increase your social security benefit, but you're going to decrease your, your actual liquid net worth or your portfolio because you're gonna have to live off those assets rather than let them keep growing. And it's really not a bad solution. It's really just a personal preference here. So for her, what I'm going to say is since she won't necessarily benefit from a spousal benefit of 50% of bills, since her benefit on her own is going to be higher anyway, I would say that let's go ahead and take hers at 62 and leave that unchanged and, uh, and get her income stream started not too long after retirement. Now, what this does is, is that still leaves us a little bit of a gap for Roth conversions, which one of their big questions was taxes. Jacob, how do we lower our taxes? How do we do this? Because we realize that all of our assets are tax deferred and we know that we're going to have a huge tax bill in the future. And there's two things we want to do. Number one, I don't want Rachel, Bill said, I don't want Rachel to have all these taxes to pay if I pass away before her. But then also we don't want to hand over a huge tax bill to our kids if we could avoid it at all. So let's go ahead and take a look at their tax situation and see, hey, what is the best way to do Roth conversions, if any at all? So right here, we can see these last couple of years, they're going to have income tax, obviously from their jobs and their careers. But once that turns off, we're going to lower that back down. This is actually when Bill turns 73. So uh, this is whenever his RMDs will start, his required minimum distribution. So that's going to be money that he's got to send from his tax deferred 401ks or IRAs every single year out of his accounts because he's got a lot of money in those accounts. So what you see here is he's actually going to have an, a tax uh, rate increase. An effective tax rate is going to go up from 6.6% .6 at the federal level to 14.2. So you're going to more than double your effective tax rates simply because RMDs are kicking in. Now, what you'll see here is a big drop over here. Now, what this is doing is, is the system right now is saying that Bill is going to pass away at age 80. So what happens here is whenever Bill passes away, his RMDs are going to end. But that means Rachel's going to receive and inherit that money and she can assume that as her own, which means she does not have to continue those RMDs until she is of RMD age. That's whenever you see this big jump here. So whenever she is age 75 at the same time that Bill would have been 83, she's going to have to start taking RMDs, but now it's on the full amount. So Bill's accounts and her accounts. But the worst part is, is she's filing as a single tax filer. So this is what's called the widow's tax trap. And this is what they really are trying to avoid. They're trying to avoid these large and high tax bills later in retirement. And they're saying, is there a way to pay taxes now and help lower those issues for, for, for Rachel in the future if Bill passes away? But the second piece of this is if they don't do any Roth conversions at all, let their accounts continue to grow, that means that their kids will have to pay those tax bills in the future from inheriting really large tax deferred accounts, having to distribute that over a 10 year period and pay income taxes every single year over that time period. So. What can we do to help lower this tax bill for them? Let's take a look and see what might be optimal for them in regards to how they can do this better. So we can see here, they've got these uh, different tax brackets. Now, one thing we've, we have noticed right off the bat here is that they're, they're gonna be above that 12% bracket based on the current spending strategy. So what that means is, is right now you can see the withdrawal sequence is currently set as pro rata, meaning an equal percentage distribution from each of their account types. Now, what we probably wanna to do to change that and optimize it a little bit is say, we wanna do taxable first, so their bank and their brokerage accounts first, and then we take from their IRAs or their tax deferred accounts second. So what you can see then is that then frees up a little bit of these different brackets, the 12% bracket specifically, and that allows them to now convert up to that bracket and use part of that bracket to their advantage. So. Let's take a look at what this is gonna do. So to compare this apples to apples across the board correctly, I wanna make sure that I'm changing this to taxable, tax deferred, tax free as well. And what this will do is now you can see we still have room here in the brackets, but what you can see is we've not changed this dollar amount yet. So I wanna give you the actual effect of doing Roth conversions while doing the taxable, tax deferred, and then tax free kind of sequence of withdrawal. So let's see if we can fill up that 12% bracket and see the benefit of it. Obviously the 10% bracket doesn't do anything, 
But if we fill up that 12% bracket, which you can see here in green, so before Bill gets to age 73, he can fill up this amount here. And then also there's a little bit of a gap here between when Bill passes away and then when Rachel has to begin taking RMDs again. And so she could do some Roth conversions at that point as well if she'd like to. Now, by doing Roth conversions and only filling up the 12% bracket, Here's what's happening. They're gonna save $241,000 in taxes over the rest of their life by doing a couple things. That's tax payments actually not paid. It means that they're actually gonna save that much money on taxes. And the second part of this is now that they have money growing in a tax-free account like a Roth IRA, their kids are gonna receive that money in the future tax and penalty-free, which means they're not gonna to have to pay that tax at that point as well, whatever their current income tax rate would be. So by doing that, they're gonna save taxes, but also the future tax-free growth is factored into this particular number here as well. So $241,000 of tax savings uh, over the rest of their life and then also the inheritance for their kid's life. But what happens if we increase this again to 22% bracket? So what we can see here is that it actually is not as impactful to go all the way to the 22% bracket at least every single year. Now, should they perhaps look at the 22% bracket early on in retirement? Maybe so before Rachel's Social Security starts kicking in. Um, but what this is saying is if you filled up the 22% bracket the whole time, you would only end up with that much more. Now, if you wanted to go above the 12% bracket a little bit for any particular year, you probably could and still benefit greatly from it. But if you did one strategy for the rest of your life, the 12% bracket, filling that one up for the rest of your life, that one's gonna be more optimal than going all the way to that 22% bracket and making that big jump. So by taking care of all these different things and explaining these different ideas to both Bill and Rachel and sharing, hey, here's some things to consider, they're now able to have a higher spending amount on the monthly basis. They're more comfortable with their elections for when they're gonna take Social Security. They know that they've gotta get more uh, asset location or tax optimized in their investments. And they also realize they probably need to be doing some Roth conversions to help lower the tax bill for Rachel in the future, but then also lower the tax bill for their kids whenever they inherit those assets later on down the road as well. So some of these ideas might apply to you. And if they do, I'd love to hear your comments down below. Share with me anything that you thought I maybe should have presented here or something maybe I should have done differently. I'd love to hear your feedback on this. So if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and also be sure to subscribe to the channel. And again, thank you so much for being here. We will see you next time.